Oh, that's loud. Uh, I'm loud. There you go. That's better. I know it's the trainee's fault. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Great to have you here. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, really looking forward to the opportunity tonight to worship together and pray together and hear God's word together and take communion together and end this fast together. Um, so just um, thank you for being here. Thank you for all that you brought um, to pitch in and just excited for this opportunity tonight. So we're going to begin tonight. Marge is going to come and she is going to open us up with, uh, with God's word. Um, going to be reading from Matthew chapter nine. So you can use this one here, mom. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, 1 to 17. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And he arose and departed uh, to his house. Now, when the multitudes saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power to men. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his, and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch, patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Praise be to the Lord. Amen. Amen. And all the saints and angels bow before your throne. And all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sin. of it all, you are worthy of it all, for from you are all things, and to you are all things, you deserve the glory. And all the saints and angels 
are you, Lord? You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you all. Great are you, Lord. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. Bread in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your bread in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your bread in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. One more time. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your bread. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your.
your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. Oh, he's great. And great are you, Lord. Oh, he's great. And great are you, One more time, he's great. Great are you, Lord. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. Worthy to be praised. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray, finding me thy all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Yeah. 
I've never known a love like yours. No, I've never known, I've never known a love like yours. Oh, I've never known a love like yours. No, I've never known a love like yours. Oh, I've never known a love like you. And hallelujah, hallelujah, what a beautiful way you've shown us, hallelujah. Hallelujah, what a wonderful Savior, hallelujah, and hallelujah, hallelujah, what a beautiful way you've shown us, hallelujah. Hallelujah, what a wonderful Savior, hallelujah, and hallelujah, hallelujah, what a beautiful way you've shown us, hallelujah. Hallelujah, what a wonderful Savior. I've never known a love like yours. I've never known a love like yours. I've never known a love like Jesus, I've never known a love like yours. Oh, I've never known a love like yours. No one compares to you. I've never known a love like yours. No, I've never known a love like yours. Oh, you are. 
First John chapter three, verse one. It's familiar to a lot of you. Let's just real slowly take it in. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And this is my favorite part. And that is what we are. And that is what we are. If you are in Christ, you are a child of God. You are not hoping, you are not climbing, you are not maybe. You are a child of God. It is settled and you are secure. And that is what you are. Rest in that and rejoice. Sometimes the greatest rejoicing is not our shouts, but our rest. It's not how loud we are, but how sure we are that he is who he says he is and he has done what he said that he would do and that is what we are heavenly father thank you for loving us thank you for loving me in fact tonight would you just join me whether it it may be uncomfortable for you but just raise your voice, even if it's just a whisper, and tell him, thank you for loving me. Even if you feel unloved, tell him, thank you for loving me. Even if it's hard to believe, even if you struggle to love yourself, just raise your voice and tell him what he promises. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, God, that I am loved. Thank you that I am chosen. Thank you that I have been paid for. Thank you that I have been adopted. Thank you that I am secure in you. Thank you that you are my God, that you are my maker, and I am yours. That we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Thank you that you are not considering us. Thank you that you are not calculating. Thank you that you are not seeing how it goes. You have committed yourself to love us. You have chosen to place your name upon us. We are yours. God, forgive us. Forgive me for all the other things getting in the way of the one thing. Forgive me for all the things I'm not sure of, for letting them seep in and make me question what you said is settled. Forgive me for trying to believe instead of just choosing to believe that you love me because you said so, because you're good, because your love never fails, because you don't take back what you've given. If your gifts are without repentance, your love will never fail. And so I thank you today that you love us. I thank you that we are your children. That is what we are. So many things we're trying to be, and yet we are your children. So many things we'd like to become, and yet we are your children. So many things we think we need and we want, but we are your children. God, even tonight, for any of us whose knees shake and whose hearts waver, may we just take you at your word. May we believe you and may we quiet our flesh. May we silence our flesh that asks so many questions. And may we let the spirit shed abroad in our hearts the love of God and remind us moment by moment and day by day, you are loved, you are chosen, you are God's children. Thank you for loving us first. Tonight, teach us to choose to believe in your love so that you can teach us how to love you the way you deserve. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. And while you're being seated, uh, Joanne is going to come and prepare to lead us in... Uh, in
during the fast praying for our Muslim um, neighbors and friends for salvation, that they would come to know Jesus. We've just been singing about how wonderful it is to know Jesus, and we're praying now for them. And Noah led us so beautifully in that intercession last week. Um, we're ending our fast tonight. Ramadan goes on for another 20 days, so keep praying. Um, don't stop just because you're going to eat whatever you weren't eating or do whatever you weren't doing. Keep praying. Um, but tonight I want to focus a little bit on the other side of that. While we're praying for salvation for our Muslim neighbors and friends, um, our brothers and sisters in Christ who live in major Muslim majority nations, um, this is a very difficult time for them. They either have to kind of go with the flow and look like they're fasting or they stand out. Um, there's a lot of pressure on um, believers who have given their hearts to Jesus, there is a lot of pressure to deny him and to convert back to Islam. Um, there are secret believers who, who kind of just go through the ritual of Ramadan fasting because they do not want to be found out. Um, and so we want to be praying for our brothers and sisters. Um, but I've read some amazing stories this week of believers in Muslim-majority countries uh, Nations where it's illegal to have a Bible, where it's illegal to um, call on the name of Jesus, who use Ramadan um, like we do, but even more so, um, like we've done in our fast. They have devoted themselves to fasting for the salvation of their nation um, during Ramadan. So at, at a time when they um, are, are sometimes the focus of persecution, they are turning that around to use that as a time to be interceding, um, that their hearts, the heart of their nation's people would turn to Jesus. So um, we're joining them as we pray, but we are also praying for them tonight. So let, let's pray. Lord, um, we, we've just sung about it um, tonight. There's no one like you. There's no one like you, a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Jesus, there's no one like you who came to seek and save the lost. God, there's no one like you that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, you're always the initiator and we are always just responding. And so, Lord, we know that you are initiating and pursuing salvation among our Muslim friends and neighbors and we just join our prayers to your desire for them to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. But Lord, tonight as well, and I'm so grateful that so often we make things an either or, and with you, it's so often a both and. I'm so grateful that we can pray for salvation for our Muslim acquaintances and friends and neighbors, but we can also pr pray for our Christian brothers and sisters who are struggling during Ramadan. Thank you, God, that we can do both those things. We don't have to pick one or the other. And so we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ tonight, those who live in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in Northern and Central Africa, where it is especially hard to follow you, um, especially during Ramadan. God, we pray for secret believers. We, we pray for those who feel compelled to observe Ramadan for fear for their lives or their livelihood or um, being kicked out of their homes. Lord, we pray for your strength for them. We pray that in the middle of their Ramadan fasting, that you would be drawing them closer and closer to your heart. God, we pray for those who are afraid to be found out tonight, that you would strengthen them, that your Holy Spirit would breathe your life in them and through them in such a way God, that they would radiate your glory. Lord, we, um, we pray for those who are standing out in Ramadan. We pray for those who, by their very not fasting during the day, are um, obvious targets of persecution. God, I read stories this week about people who simply cannot pretend to do Ramadan because they are so glad to be free of the chains, Lord. They, they can't pretend anymore. They have to 
loudly belong to you. God, we praise you for those brothers and sisters today. And we pray, Lord, that their very difference would cause people to ask them why they've converted from Islam, why they've chosen Jesus um, in the middle of this holy month uh, in, in Islam. Lord, thank you for people with boldness who have got a taste of you and will not turn back. Lord, we pray your blessing and abundance on them today. God, we pray that you would have to give them opportunity after opportunity to testify of your goodness and to share your love. And Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters today who are going to use their own persecution as a prompt to intercede for their friends, for their neighbors, for their families, Lord. Um, again, I, I am so grateful at the beautiful work you do in the hearts of your people. Um, and so, Lord, I, I pray for those who are fasting and praying for salvation. God, we join our hearts. Lord, and we pray for your strength and your protection for them. Lord, we pray for those who are under pressure from their family to deny you. Lord, we pray that you would be strengthening every shaky knee, that you would be setting firm every wavering heart tonight, Lord. And you would do a beautiful work um, in your people in these Muslim countries, God, who are at all different stages of their walk with you, that you would use each one of them, God, to shine your light. And Lord, we don't understand um, how persecution works. We don't understand that as people are pushed down, somehow your glory is seen, but we know that it's true. So God, as your people are pushed down during Ramadan, would you let your glory be seen? Would you let your glory be seen? We're, we are so grateful, Lord. We're so grateful for your heart, for the world you created. God, we're so grateful that the salvation of uh, the children of Abraham is your heartbeat. So God, use our prayers tonight to lift up the arms of our brothers. Use our prayers, God, to soften hearts and to bring salvation, Lord, because there is nothing better than knowing you. And we long, we long for people to know you. Thank you, God. We love you so much. We're so grateful for an opportunity um, to use our prayers, for you to use our prayers, God, as you build your kingdom. So have your way. Let your kingdom come. Lord, let your will be done in every part of the world as it is in heaven. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Joanne. Amen. So just going to ask you, um, welcome again tonight. Um, just take two minutes. Let's take two minutes. Greet somebody. Welcome them. Thank them for being here. And then we will, uh, we'll jump right into the scriptures.
thank you guys for being here tonight. A um, couple of quick things. Um, you can start turning to Matthew chapter 9, um, but as you're turning there, a couple of things. We are going to be taking communion tonight at the end of the message. Um, if you did not get the elements, I think they are, are they still out in the, is the basket still out there? Oh, no, it's over here. Great. Anybody need, anybody need if you just lift a hand? No, nope, we're all good. Great job, everybody. <laughs> so um, so we will be taking communion at the end. Also, for those that may not be with us regularly, we have been fasting the last 10 days, and at the end of service, after communion, we're going to be eating together. And so you, whether you've been fasting or not, please stay. Whether you're regularly here or not, please stay. There's plenty of food. would love to have you not only eat, but spend this time in fellowship with us. And then also this coming week is um, with it's it's Holy Week. There's a lot of stuff going on all over the place. So a couple of things are different for us this week. Wednesday night Bible study is different this week. So this Wednesday night we will not be at Tom and Joanne's house. We will be here at Grace at six thirty. David Cohen is going to be teaching um, Wednesday night um, from Passover. Excuse, excuse me. Yes, from Passover to the Lord's return. Um, a teaching about seeing the intimacy of God, his, his heart's desire in the festivals of Israel. And so would love to have you join us for this for the Bible study. Again, that 6.30 right here. Um, David's going to be teaching. And, you know, we didn't plan it this way, but if I read the calendar right, Wednesday is Passover. So it is really, really great that we get to come together and, and, and be taught and learn and share together on Passover. And so I am also going to ask you to do this on Wednesday. As you prepare your hearts... Be praying for the Jewish people. Be praying that as they eat the Passover, that they will come to know the Lamb of God. Be praying that in this quote-unquote ceremony, that the truth would be revealed. That the heart of the Father would be revealed through the Son. So let's make Wednesday a day of prayer, uh, you know, and, and, you know, not to get on a soapbox. You know, we should be praying for Israel. We should be praying for the hearts of the Jews every single day to come to salvation. But let's make Wednesday a day of prayer where we really give our hearts and our time to praying for the salvation of Israel. Then Friday night, there is a Good Friday service here at Grace at seven o'clock. It is just going to be a time of worship and prayer. It's going to basically be like a, an, an encounter night that we do, but on Good Friday. Saturday night, we will be here like usual for our usual service, and then Sunday morning, we are taking part in the sunrise service in Burlington City. Um, there at the riverfront at 7 o'clock is when the service begins. Service is usually about 40, 45 minutes, and then after that, we're all invited to Broad Street United Methodist Church for their annual Easter breakfast. So would love to have you join us whenever you can, however you can. So... So you're, you're there with me in Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to get to that in a few minutes. But tomorrow is Palm Sunday, right? Tomorrow is the day that we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It is the day that he came in riding on a colt, declaring that, 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 that moment, while he didn't do it with his mouth, that moment declared that he was the king. As palms were waved and the crowds began to shout from Psalm 118, Hosanna, save now, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I think it's important for us to not look backwards and think we understand what was happening because we see the outcome. But to remember that Jesus was riding into Jerusalem for the Passover. He was riding into Jerusalem for a feast. And so tonight we will break or, or we will end our fast by having a meal together. Because we've spent the last 10 days fasting, setting aside something that we are dependent upon so that we can further depend upon God. Purposely creating weakness so that we can rest in his strength. Even giving up something that we enjoy so that we can learn how to truly delight in, to find our greatest joy in Jesus. And so we have fasted not to get God's attention, but to give him ours. Not to get something from him, but to give him ourselves in an even greater measure. And so tonight when we're finished, as we prepare to end the fast, I pray that we recognize that we've spent these 10 days feasting on him. 
that we've spent these 10 days kind of taking control of the flesh so that we can give the spirit control. That we haven't neglected ourselves, but instead we have redirected our hunger. We have redirected our desire. We have redirected our attention and our focus. And in many ways, that's the same thing Jesus did in that last week where he rode in to celebrate the Passover. He was also giving the cup of the new covenant, right? He was giving his body to be broken for us. He was establishing, fulfilling the promises of the law, but then establishing the purposes of God's heart. And so what we see, and, and this will not be a, Palm Sunday message. But what we see are these parallels that what Jesus was coming to do is what he's invited us into. And I believe that Matthew 9, while it is not generally a passage that we would use during the Easter theme, I believe that Matthew 9 really teaches us a lot about what God has been leading us into and what I pray that we are asking God to do in our lives. In Matthew 9, which is the passage that Marge read for us at the beginning of our service, Jesus' ministry was still relatively new. He had been baptized and tempted. He had preached the Sermon on the Mount. He had begun to do miracles, and he drew great crowds. But there were also still a lot of questions. A lot of questions and a lot of opinions. What I find interesting is that most of the questions, or at least the recorded questions, came from the most religious people. You notice that the people that should have known him didn't know him, and that the people that should have been ready weren't ready, and that the people that had the most questions and seemed to be the, the, um, the most cynical were the ones that were the most religious. At the beginning of the chapter, we find that a paralyzed man was brought to Jesus by his friends. Now, this story is in all three of the synoptic gospels. It's in Mark 2 and Luke 5. And in those two passages, it tells us that the house where Jesus was teaching was so full that the man's friends went to the roof, they made a hole in the roof, and then they lowered their friend down to Jesus. What I find most interesting is all three accounts say that Jesus responded to the man because of the faith of his friends. Listen to what it says here in in Matthew 9. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic. When Jesus saw the faith of his friends, he said to the man, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Even if you don't see faith in the people you are praying for, even if you don't see anything that looks like change, looks like movement, looks like hope, keep praying. God is faithful. And so the person that you are praying for doesn't have to suddenly have faith. Just keep praying from your faith. Keep praying from your relationship with God. Keep praying from your confidence in him because he will work even in other people's lives because of the faith that those that are following him have. God is faithful. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 says that Sarah had a child long after her years of childbearing had passed because she counted the one who promised to be faithful. But not only is God faithful, God honors faithfulness. He answered Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayers long after they believed that they could be answered. But even then, even in believing that it was too late, they were too old, this this thing was never going to happen for them, what we find about them is they remained faithful. When the angel came to Zechariah, where was he? Serving in the temple, doing his job, serving God, blessing the people, being priestly. We find that they were faithful even when they weren't receiving what they had hoped. See, faithfulness is not believing for what you want God to do. It's not even when you, what you think God's, believing for what you think God said. Faithfulness is obedience to God's word and God's character, even when you're not seeing the outcome you wanted. Faithfulness is to stay the course, keep praying, just believe, and trust God's character. That's faithfulness. Like faithfulness isn't, I'm going to make this happen. Faithfulness isn't, I'm going to do what I have to do so God does what he has to do. Faithfulness is, I will obey him. My obedience is not based on an outcome. 
My obedience, that means my obedience is not trying to get what I want and isn't greater when he's doing what I think he should do and lesser when he's not. My obedience is based on who I know him to be. Stay faithful. And I want to go back to those two words, just believe. You know, those are hard words for us, and yet we kind of throw them around. We'll tell each other, just believe. And it's hard to just believe. John 6 says that believing is the work that we're called to. So that means believing isn't easy, but believing is all that's necessary. That's what just believe means. Just believe doesn't mean, don't worry about it. Just believe. It means, just keep believing. Cast out the questions. Set aside the doubts. Keep moving in the direction that you're called to. Just believe. Because remember when those words were spoken. It's when Jesus had gone with Jairus, and Jai Jesus was, had gone with Jairus. The crowd had slowed them down. The woman, that woman with the issue of blood had have slowed them down. And then finally, someone came from Jairus' house and said to Jesus, don't bother the teacher any longer. Your daughter is dead. And Jesus said, just believe. What did that mean in the moment? What it meant in the moment was, let's keep going. Let's just keep going. Let's, the, the direction I pointed us in, let's keep going. Let's, let's just go to the house. Let, don't worry about what you've heard. Just stay the course. Hold firm to what you know I've said. Hold firm to me. If I said I'm coming with you, just let me keep coming. Don't worry about the noise. Hold firm to my hand. That's what just believe means. It's not trying to figure it out. It's not trying to make it happen. It's not believing that someday I'll get to this and someday I'll get to that. And then when this happens, then I'll finally do that. It is just doing what I know to do because he is who he says that he is. Stay the course. Keep praying. Just believe and trust God's character. Now, when the young man or the man was let down through the roof, I don't know why I've always pictured him as young, but I do. But when he was let down through the roof and Jesus heals him, what Jesus said to him was, your sins are forgiven. And when Jesus said that, some of the scribes began saying to themselves, this man is blaspheming. So what Jesus said didn't seem right to them. Right, him, him forgiving sins made them uncomfortable. It offended them because there was something they knew. Only God had the power to forgive sins. So when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, it made them uncomfortable. It was kind of what they were looking for. Aha, he is too good to be true. It, made, it, it offended what they believed and what they knew and what they'd been taught and what they taught everyone else. So can I tell you something tonight that's going to make us uncomfortable? They were right. They were right. For anyone other than Jesus to say that, it would have been blasphemy. For anyone other than Jesus to say that, it would have, they would have been ex completely right. They were right to be offended. They were right to be uncomfortable. Only God has the power to forgive sins. Jesus was purposefully offending their flesh so that he could open their spirits to the fact that he was the Messiah. That he was the anointed one. That he was God in the flesh. And so they needed to be offended or else they were never going to believe. And some of us are exactly the same way. Our minds are made up. Our hearts are hard about certain things. We have decided that we know the way that God works. And we know what God means when he says this. And we know what it me the scripture means when it's written this way. And he has to offend us. Because if he doesn't, we'll never listen to him. And so Jesus answered them, answered, remember, they were just thinking this. And Jesus answers them and says, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk. Listen to this part. But that you may know. So I'm teaching you something here is what he's saying. I, I understood. I knew you wouldn't like this. So I did it on purpose. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And the man got up, healed, and went home. See, the only way for the scribes to learn who Jesus was for, was for Jesus to shake up what they thought they knew already. Again, I'll repeat myself. Sometimes God has to offend our senses to give us a new perspective. Sometimes God has to shake loose the things we're holding on to too tightly to give us what we can have not ever yet taken hold of. Sometimes God has to challenge what we're sure of so that he can teach us what our eyes have not seen and our minds have not yet imagined. If you've walked with Christ for long, Things aren't now where you, where you started, right? There were things you were sure of that turns out I was surely wrong. 
There were things that you, you were convinced of. This is the way. We were stubborn and we were, we were zealous, but we were stubbornly zealous or zealously stubborn, depending on which side of the fence you may be on. But the reality is he's always progressing. He's always leading us. He's always teaching us. And part of being taught is being untaught. Part of being taught is, being, is, is allowing him to challenge what we're sure of so he can teach us what we haven't ever known before. Some of us are similar to the scribes and that we're holding tightly to what we know and we're trusting in what we want from God. We are clinging to how we think things should be and we are refusing what God is actually doing because it's not what we wanted or expected him to do, right? Sometimes we are, are blind to the work of God because we've decided how God needs to work. As my friend Pastor Alex from Journey Church recently said in one of his sermons, we get frustrated with God because he is not keeping promises he never made. And some of us have this whole God promised me, and God's saying, it wasn't me. You, you asked for it, but I didn't promise it. See, all of his promises are yes in him. So that means our promises aren't about what we want from him. Our promises, his promises are about what he's doing in us. He has promised to conform us to the image of Jesus. He has promised to transform us. He has promised that the spirit would overflow like, like rivers of living water from within us. Let's hold on to the promises of being made like him rather than the promises of what we want him to make life for us. Because his promises are true but they are to make us in his image. From there, Matthew 9 says that Jesus saw Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth and that he called out to Matthew, follow me. Matthew got up, left not only his booth, left his job, his career, the plan that he had for his life, and he just went with Jesus. Like, do, you, do we realize the, the apostles had jobs? They had businesses, they had careers, they had dreams, they had goals, they had, they had family expectations. And when they followed him, they left all that. I think sometimes we just think Matthew got up from a table and went with Jesus. And so a lot of us are having a hard time leaving. A lot of us are having a hard time setting stuff aside, letting things go, not ordering the, our lives the way that we thought that they would be. We're trying to follow Jesus and carry our stuff. And what ends up happening is we start to try to guide Jesus rather than being guided by him. We, we sort of point him in the right direction for where we think we're supposed to go rather than being willing to leave everything to follow him. It says that Luke writes that after this, that Matthew had a feast um, or a party in Jesus' honor where he invited all of his friends. And as you might expect, the friends of a tax collector were sinners and tax collectors. And so while Jesus was there at Matthew's house enjoying the feast and enjoying Matthew's friends, the Pharisees went and asked the other disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So the scribes didn't understand what Jesus said. The Pharisees didn't understand who Jesus, who Jesus hung out with. Right? The Pharisees were judging Jesus by the people at his table. Rather than judging him by the miracles, rather than judging him by the scriptures, rather than judging him by the words, they judged him by what made them uncomfortable, the people that he sat with. Scripture says that Jesus heard it or that he heard about it. We don't really know which. And so rather than leaving it to the disciples to deal with the Pharisees, Jesus answered them and said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus didn't meet the Pharisees' expectations for the Messiah. And because he didn't meet their expectations, they refused to acknowledge all the work that he was doing and all the truth that he was speaking. Right? It's the same thing that happened in Nazareth. It says that they were amazed at his miracles and that they were astonished at his words, but that they refused to believe him because he was Jesus. He was, he was Mary and Joseph's son. He was, he was their, their brother-in-law. He was their, they'd watched him grow up. And so rather than walking in, rather than grabbing hold of being amazed, they sort of leaned on what was familiar. They, they let what they were uncomfortable with get in the way of the fact that it was God himself that was making him uncomfortable. The Pharisees demanded that Jesus meet their expectations rather than humbling themselves and considering that God's desires, God's plans, God's purposes were different than theirs. 
Don't many of us struggle with that too? Don't many of us still struggle with, why isn't it the way I thought it would be? Why isn't it the way I hoped it would be? Why isn't it the way it is for them? Why, why is it that I've been waiting and they, and, and, and they didn't even wait long? Why is it that I, I'm busier than they are? Why, why, why do they keep getting rewarded? When are you going to do this for me? And then we even misappropriate the scriptures and we jump into the Psalms and we're saying, how long, oh Lord? And the only thing that bothers us is we're not getting our way. Because God continues to be moving in our hearts and moving in our lives and moving in our community. See, if life isn't what we expected, sometimes we refuse to see what God's doing. We refuse to acknowledge how he's working. We refuse to humble ourselves and seek his kingdom rather than our way. Let's just think about the Pharisees for a minute. They would have been pleased to have Jesus come to do miracles, defeat Rome, and reestablish Israel as the most powerful nation on earth. That's what they expected, that's what they wanted, and that's what they were holding out for. And so when Jesus didn't do that, they rejected Jesus because they wanted what they wanted more than what he came to bring. But think about this. If they got their way, if they got their way, they would have enjoyed this life but perished in the next if they got their way, Israel would have been restored on earth, but not for eternity. If they got their way, the nations would have been Israel's permanent enemies rather than their everlasting brothers and sisters. If they got their way, they would have lost so much more than they could have ever dreamed. If they got their way, Jesus' words, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul, would have been theirs for all of eternity. So then let me ask today, what if the same is true on a smaller scale for us? What if right now, today, getting what we want costs us what God has planned? What if our disappointment, our frustration, or even our anger over not getting our way is the thing that's in the way of seeing how God is working? Of seeing what God or hearing what God is saying and seeing what God has planned? What if the only way to have God's will is to refuse our own? Right, because we act like Jesus only wrestled with the will of the Father in Gethsemane, but Jesus had said over and over again, I came not to do my will, but to do the will of the Father. We have to accept that at face value. What does it mean? If he said, I didn't come to do my will, doesn't it mean that there were at least moments in Jesus' life where he had a different idea than what the Father was leading into? That there were at least moments in his humanity that he had a way he would have liked to have gone, but he stayed and went the Father's way. It wasn't just at the last minute. It was all of his life, all of his incarnated life, where he was constantly yielding, saying, I, I don't understand where we're going, but I'm going with you. I don't like how this feels, but I'm trusting in you. I have a better idea, but I'm going to yield to your idea. Like, sometimes I think we forget that he was like us. We, we're, we're afraid to deal with his humanity because we're afraid it will shrink his divinity. But let me tell you, the more human you, rec you recognize Jesus to be, the more you appreciate his divinity. The more we realize he wrestled just like us, he questioned just like us, he struggled just like us, but did not sin, but did not yield, but did not give up, but did not take and grab for himself. If, if he only wrestled in Gethsemane, I don't know that I can believe that he understands me because I wrestle a lot more than one night. If he only struggled with the will of God one time, then how much can he actually identify with me and me with him? But the reality is he kept saying, I didn't come to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. Why? Because he wanted to make sure we understand being obedient isn't easy, but it's worth it. Trusting the heart of God will always provide more than demanding our way from God. Are we willing? Are we willing to silence our flesh so we can hear the Spirit? Because I really do think that's the biggest issue that most of us are facing. Because there's this reality, and we were talking about it in our men's meeting this morning over at Tabernacle Baptist. There's this reality that Elijah heard the Holy Spirit. He heard God in a still, small whisper. I don't know about you, my flesh is rarely still, small, or whispering. My flesh is loud. 
And so my flesh is always shouting and God's spirit is always whispering. And I think what we're waiting for is God to outshout the flesh. That's not how it works. God is working in us that we would quiet the flesh, that we would stop giving attention to the flesh, that we would starve the flesh, that we would kill the flesh, as the scripture says, that we would crucify the flesh daily. So instead of God having to raise his game, we're actually yielding to him. We're choosing him. Are we willing to silence our flesh so that we can hear the Spirit. So we've had a question from the scribes. We've had a question from the Pharisees. The next question comes from the disciples of John. John the Baptist's disciples came and they asked Jesus, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? We don't think of it often, but the disciples of John were also the religious leaders. Right, they were, not the, they were not the legal religious leaders. They had no actual authority. But because of the ministry of John, there were many people coming to John to be baptized. And so they were also now religious leaders in that day. Now, I'm not using the word negatively, religious. I know we've all heard and we've probably all said at some point, it's not a religion, it's a relationship, right? And so now the word religion has become negative. I don't want us to use it negative. I'll be honest, I think it's gotten a little silly that we think of the word as only negative. James says that pure religion is to feed the poor and care for the widows and the orphans. So clearly, religion itself is not a negative thing. In fact, if I'm going to just go ahead and get myself in trouble, what really frustrates me is when I hear people talking about people that have a religious spirit. Because according to James, having a religious spirit is a spirit of generosity, selflessness, and love. What people like to call a religious spirit is not at all religious. It's pride, it's selfishness, stubbornness, and superiority. It's usually the belief that I know more than other people know. That's what it usually identifies itself as. And if, and if we're all there, I'll go all the way in. Truth is, most of the people that come and talk to me about somebody else having a religious spirit are the ones with the problem. That's what usually happens. Can I be honest with you? There's no religious spirit. Can we stop throwing the word spirit on the end of everything that we don't like or we don't understand? There's no religious spirit. There's pride. There is a stubbornness. There is anger. There's all this stuff. But if pure religion is to be generous and faithful, then how could a spirit of religion be negative? Let's, let's stop making things more than they need to be and deal with scriptures with, with, with what scripture tells us to deal with. You know what? If you deal with your pride, you won't have a religious spirit, whatever that means. If we deal with our stubbornness, we won't have this thing that we're talking about. If we deal with the things that Scripture tells us to deal with, if we deal with our hearts, we won't have to be afraid of all of these other things. The disciples of John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. At least they should have. Right, John had preached his entire ministry that he was not the Messiah, but that the Messiah was coming. When John baptized Jesus, he made it known to everybody that Jesus was the one that John had been waiting for. John's the one who called him publicly the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then John told his disciples that Jesus was the one sent from heaven, and it was time for John to decrease so that Jesus could increase. That means that they knew who Jesus was, but they didn't understand everything that Jesus did. And even more, they didn't understand the things that Jesus didn't do. I think we have a hard time with people that are following the Lord with us, but not following the Lord like us. I think we really struggle with people that love Jesus, but don't have the same, don't, don't, don't project it the same way that I do. Don't have the same interpretation, the same denomination, the same personal conviction that I do. We struggle with that because as much as we want our freedom, we want everybody to look the same. Because we're afraid if they're right, I might be wrong. But I'm pretty sure I'm right, so that means they must be wrong. And the reality of Scripture is we're not called to be exactly the same. That's, that, that's what we learn through the Scriptures. And if I can pat you on the back tonight, that's part of what I love about this group of people. It's part of what I love. Like we sit in this room week after week and we come together and eat meals and study the scriptures and worship and pray together all the different times during the week, week after week. And we sit here and we are Baptists and Pentecostals and Presbyterians and Methodists and Charismatics and this and that. And I'm not saying that's what we were. Say that's what we are. It's how we got here. But getting here means we're one. 
And so we can have a different background, we can have a different interpretation, we can have a different denomination, we can have some differences because what we see is the work of Christ in us. And that makes me desire you. But we struggle with why do they have to do it this way? Why do they interpret it that way? If we all have the same spirit, shouldn't we all think, say, and do the same things? That's part of, that's part of why every election cycle is such a disaster in the church. Because somehow we have believed that if the Holy Spirit's leading me one way, he has to leave you in the same way, or else one of us got led the wrong way, right? And so we should either all vote the same, or something's wrong in the middle of us. And so it's always a disaster. And it shouldn't be. We should have the most freedom, not the least. And yet here we are constantly battling over things that don't need to be battled over. I think we forget the importance of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to read it. It's a long passage, but it needs to be heard in its entirety. Chapter, uh, verses 4 through 11. Paul writes, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So that means our activities are different, but our God is the same. Well, why do they do it this way? Because God led them to do it. Well, why don't I do it that way? Because God didn't lead you to do it. But he leads in all of these things. It goes on to say, to teach is given the manifestation, oh, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. By, to another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills, which means we can walk together and be different. We can be led by the Spirit and not led in the same path. We can be with each other, even for each other, without being like each other. The disciples of John struggled with that. And I think most of us struggle with it too. And maybe we don't struggle, maybe you don't struggle with it now. It took a while to get there, right? Because for some reason, we constantly think that our way is the right way, which makes us then believe that somebody else's way must be the wrong way. What if the same Spirit is leading us in different ways? Because one Spirit provides all that is needed for all activities. I think the disciples of John, their question was really simple. If we are supposed to now follow you, why aren't you doing what John taught us to do? If you're to be our leader now, does that mean we have to change? Jesus answered, and he said, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So Jesus equates, and this is really important, and, and, and as we're closing this fast, this is really important. Jesus equates the kind of fasting that John and the Pharisees were doing with mourning. Right? Right? So they say, why don't you fast? And Jesus says, can they mourn while I'm here? So Jesus is saying that there is a different kind of fasting. They fasted as part of their repentance. They fasted because of what they knew they lacked. They fasted from an empty place. But Jesus was teaching not that fasting was over, but that he was going to instill a brand new way of fasting. Right? Jesus' fast was not like the Pharisees. Jesus' fast was not an emptiness. Jesus' fast was not of lack. Jesus had been baptized. He'd heard the voice of the Father. The Holy Spirit rested upon him and drove him to the wilderness to fast 40 days and be tempted by, by Satan. So that means at Jesus' highest spiritual moment, go fast. That was what the Spirit drove him to. The, when Jesus heard the Father, when Jesus was a called to ministry, when Jesus was empowered by the Spirit, the first thing he called him to do was go and fast. Jesus' fast was from his abundance, not his emptiness. He was being consecrated. He was being prepared. He was becoming dependent upon the Father and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' fast, he was learning obedience. He was learning to watch the Father, learning to listen to the Father. He was being emptied out and filled up. 
so that he could withstand Satan and so that he could fully yield to the Father. This means that Jesus was not fasting because of what was missing, but he was fasting to depend and delight upon the abundance of what he had been given. Sometimes, if we don't fast on what we've been given, we'll forget we have it. Right? Israel came out of Egypt, armed for battle, but afraid of war. Israel came out of Egypt with a cloud of God's presence and fire by night, but afraid that they were going to die. They didn't, co they didn't connect to what God had given them. And the same thing happens to many of us. We have been given everything we need, and yet we still feel that we're needy. Jesus said, and I really do believe that this gets misinterpreted. Jesus said that the disciples would fast like Jesus said that the disciples would fast like the fast of John and the Pharisees when the bridegroom was taken away. Now, I've spent a lot of time studying this and praying about it, and this is one of those things that we won't ever all agree on, but I'm going to share my view because it's my uh, I get the opportunity, right? So I'm going, to I'm going to tell you how I am interpreting this. And I'm going to be honest, I haven't always interpreted it this way. In fact, I'm just newly coming to fully interpret it this way. See, often it is taught that this is the kind of fasting that they and we would do after Jesus ascended to heaven. That we are now in the age of Jesus' absence, and so we are in the age of fasting. Like we're fasting because we miss him. We're fasting because we want him to come. We're fasting because he's not here. But listen to what Jesus said in the in-between here. Jesus said to the apostles, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And in the context of John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus was teaching that the Spirit of God would be the one who came as another helper, exactly like Jesus, that he would be the one who was going to come. So Jesus was saying, I will not leave you orphans, not I'm coming again, I'm sending my Spirit, I will be with you. And even if you don't like that interpretation... Right before he ascended, he said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is not absent. He wasn't then. He's not now. He's not absent. He's not with us physically. He is going to return. He's going to break open the clouds and land at the Mount of Olives, and we will all see him. But that doesn't mean he's not here. He is not absent. In fact, the only time Jesus was ever absent after his incarnation was the three days that he was in the grave. That was their time of mourning. That was their time of not knowing where he was or when, if he would come. That was a fast from his presence. That was their fast of sorrow, their fast of loss, their fast of lack. But the moment that he rose from the grave, that kind of fasting ended. Because Jesus remains God with us, and the Holy Spirit is God in us, now and forever. We do not fast in mourning. We do not fast for lack. We fast from abundance. We fast in joy. So we just, in just a little while, we'll finish fasting. The question that we have to deal with, and I sort of answered it already, but why did we fast? We don't fast because he's not here. We fast con to connect to and believe in and feast upon his nearness. We fast on his presence. We don't fast because we miss him, but because we desire him. We fast to give him our attention, to set our hearts and our minds and even our bodies on him. We fast because sometimes we forget the abundance that we live in and that lives in us. We fast not to get what we think we are missing, but to rejoice in, give thanks for, and depend upon who we belong to. We fast because we are forgetful. And also because we're too easily satisfied with the things that don't really matter. We fast because we are too often found seeking God to give us what we want rather than making God the one thing that we desire above all else. We fast in the body so that we can feast in the spirit. We fast in the flesh so that we can feast upon Jesus. I believe it's that it's in these places of fasting that we learn to truly delight ourselves in the Lord and then he becomes the desire of our heart. And from that place, we begin to focus more on the things his heart desires than ours. 
And that's when we have become like Jesus. When we can say, not my will, but yours be done. I have come not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. My bread, I have bread you know not of, is the will of the one who sent me. That's when we know we're being conformed. When we can not have what we wanted, but feast upon him. Because he is great. I'm going to be honest, over these last 10 days, I've been hungry in body. This fast was physically way harder than I thought it was going to be. I did literally nothing to prepare because I thought, how hard can it be? Not eating from sun, you know, from sun up to sundown. How hard could that be? I still get one meal every day. I knew I was cutting out sweets, which I figured that would be a mental battle. But I haven't worked out since Tuesday because I've been dizzy and I've been tired and I've had headaches and I felt like I was getting sick when all I was was getting hungry, which in some ways shows how rarely we ever actually are hungry. But as hungry as I've been in body, I've been full in spirit. See, this this fast made me stop thinking about myself. And it made me stop concentrating on the things I call problems. It made me stop wondering when I'll get my way or when my time will come. And this fast forced me to not just depend on Jesus, it forced me to see that I can delight in Jesus. And it shined a light on the places in my life where I've wanted more than Jesus. Where I've, where I've said, I'm glad I've got Jesus, but it would be awful good to get in that building. I'm glad I've got Jesus, but if we could get these bills paid, I'm glad I've got Jesus, but if this would happen or if that would happen, and to realize that I was just saying I'm glad I've got Jesus, there was nothing in me glad about him. Because most of my attention was on the thing he hadn't done yet, the thing he hadn't given yet. In fact, in a lot of ways, I found that I was manipulate, trying to manipulate him by giving some sort of praise to him so that he would hear what I'm still lacking from him. You know, things are great, God, I love you, but if you want to you handle that, I would be really pleased. I come out of this fast hungry and full at the same time. Personally, I come out of this fast empty and overflowing. I come out of this fast more confident in His love and trusting in His sovereignty. I come out of this fast more aware of the Holy Spirit's presence, God's goodness, and Jesus' return than I ever have been before. See, God is not far off. He is with us, and He is in us, and He's coming to us. Sometimes we have to fast the things that our flesh craves so that our spirits can remember to crave the God who never leaves us. Sounds like we've got a warning of some sort. Tornado warning? Okay. (laughs) <laughs> that's right so so we'll take one minute and anybody whose phone's on we can turn them off and uh <laughs> really fine we'll make it through and in tornado warnings god is with us but i tell you what tornado warning or not we're eating that food right like <laughs> There are to-go plates. Whatever we got to do, I'm breaking this fast tonight. I promise you that. (laughs) As we have fasted together for these last 10 days, before we go out there and eat a meal, let's feast together on Jesus. Before we go eat a meal, let's, let's eat and drink communion together. And then after we have sat at his table, we can go out and sit at a table with each other. After we have sat and remembered his suffering and his gift and his love, we can go sit down together and talk to each other about the abundance of God's goodness. Talk to each other about what he has given and shown and reminded us of during this fast. So we're not going to do this the way that we usually do. We're not going to come up and sing a song. We're not going to try to create a lot of fanfare. We're just going to tonight pull up to the Lord's table and then come together at the table as the Lord's people. And I want us to remember and rejoice. Feast and celebrate. Let's look forward to His return by living in the abundance of His presence. And remember these three things. The Father is for us. Jesus is with us. And the Spirit is in us. We have long lists of petitions. And if they all get answered, they won't compare to those three things we've already been given. 
And if none of them get answered, they won't take away from those three things that have already been given. And so tonight, we don't just have enough. We are super abounding, as the Greek actually says. We have too much. We are overflowing with the goodness of God here together. And the last thing before we eat to eat and drink. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when he gave the directions to the church in Corinth who were miserably abusing the Lord's table. He wrote this to them at the very end. As often as you eat, every time you eat this, you eat it unto the Lord's return. See, while we are looking back to the cross and the, and the empty grave, we're also every time we take this saying, and he's coming again. We're not just saying thank you for what you did. We're also saying, and he's coming again. And so tonight, let's thank him for what he's done. And let's remind ourselves, and he's coming again. Would you bow your heads with me? And we will begin, we'll prepare to eat and drink together. Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight. Thank you tonight that you wanted us. The only reason we have anything to celebrate is because you wanted us. Because you're patient with us, not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. The only reason we have anything to celebrate is because you desire that everyone would be saved. Lord, I, I confess I still don't understand this plan of redemption. I still don't understand how you could give your own son to pay for me. And yet I'm so thankful that you did. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for not coming to do your will, but the will of the Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for laying down both your body and your blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for not just becoming like us, but for doing whatever was necessary to make us like you. May we never take it lightly. And may we never look past you, hoping that you'll be the means to our end. May we constantly believe you are all I need. Lord, we thank you today for your body that was broken so that we could be the unbroken body of Christ. And we thank you for your blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins and redemption. Tonight, as we eat and as we drink, may we do it fully aware of how greatly we are loved and how worthy you are of our love. May this not be some sort of ticket to heaven. May it be an invitation to your table. And may it be the, the truth that we cling to in every season and situation of our lives. Let's eat together. And let's drink together. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are enough. But not only are you enough, you are good. You are not the minimum. You are not our satisfaction. You are more than we could have ever asked or dreamed. You are far more than we have ever could even think we deserve. But you are also more than we'll ever need. And so tonight, God, I pray that we would gather around these tables together and that we would not just talk about or remember the difficulty of fasting, but the joy of being filled with the Spirit. The joy of being loved by the Father. The joy of being interceded for by the Son. May we abound in thanksgiving. Because you are reason to give thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, here's what we're going to do. Those who are going to go set up are going to go out and get things ready. It'll probably take about five minutes. So for the next five minutes, just hang out in here, talk to each other, bless each other, pray with each other, however God leads you. Just a little, little, little bit of instruction for anybody who might need it. 
if you've actually been fasting uh, over this 10 days, don't go stuff yourself. You'll be sick by the time you get home. Go slow. There are takeout containers. Take some stuff home if you want to. Enjoy yourself. But here's what I'd like us to do. Talk together about the fast. We started this with Joanne preaching and closing by asking us to talk to each other about what God had put on our hearts to fast. So let's close this by coming together and talking about what God spoke to us during the fast. You can talk about how hungry you've been. I already did. I probably will again. But don't leave out how good God's been. Don't leave out the places he convicted you, the places he comforted you, the places he encouraged you. Don't leave out the hard parts and the good parts. Let's really rejoice tonight that we have a God who is more than enough and who has invited us to be his children. Love you guys. God bless you. About five minutes, they'll open the doors and tell us to go eat. Don't stampede anybody.